What's up, everybody? I'm your host, Chris Hampton. And this is Nate Drolet. And we are wearing matching sweatshirts. That was cute of us. I know. I actually just noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> I almost wore a blue t-shirt underneath mine as well today, but I switched it to black at the last second. Nice. You'll. Uh, this will come as a surprise, but this is also, this blue t-shirt is also a power company. Uh, well, yep. mine was going to be too. Yeah. We basically <laughs> had the same person pick out our wardrobes today, whoever that was. Yes. You're just hoodless, and I am hooded. I know. the new. Ho- I like the new hoodies on, of uh, the sweatshirt. I do, too. I've been living in mine, actually, pretty much full-time since I got them. <laughs> Understandably. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, are, we are gathered here today, dearly beloveds, to uh, discuss how we can take lessons that we learn in the gym and transfer those, translate those to climbing outside. Um, And some of you might think, well, they're basically the same. Uh, So, you know, you take all the lessons. But I, I think the two have sort of inherently different constraints Like the gym is set up in one way that outdoors is not always set up and the environment is different and the, the amount of roots or boulders is different. And, you know, there's so much different about the two that if we look at those constraints and how those things sort of uh, force us into a specific solution or allow us a, a specific solution, um, These are the things we're trying to get at, that we can pinpoint those things and then translate those to our climbing outside. Does that Mm -hmm. sound about right to you? Yeah. You know, and I think, like, I definitely agree. I think for some people, they see it as a one-to-one. I think there's also the category of people who look at indoor climbing purely as a a tool that had, like... Yeah. And to the point to where when they step outside, they just abandon anything that might have been useful there. Because for them, they're like, oh, well, this is just training for outdoors. But like, there are some things that are really useful that we do indoors, whether we realize it or not. Um, that I know I've been guilty of that in the past of mm-hmm. having these just be two completely different things in my mind. And not realizing it's like, oh, I, I, I do a good job over here. Why, why don't I just do that also outside? Yeah, totally. It's not like I, there have been times in my climbing where I've thought of the gym as kind of the weight room. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Do you, do you have any like specific memories of when that shifted for you or, or anything that sort of caused it to? For me, it's injury. Hmm. Like when I was, there was a time when I was coming back from, was it a finger? I think it was my first like finger injury and it forced me to look at climbing differently in the gym. And, and because it sort of coincided with summer coming and I'm like, oh, well, my season is basically done and now I'm in the gym. Let me find things I can climb without aggravating my finger and perform on those like I do outside, you know? Hmm. Um, So for me, I think that was the first big switch. It seems like it would go the other way, but I I so badly wanted to be climbing outside that I started treating the gym more like climbing outside. Funny. I mean, no, I think that makes sense. For me, it was definitely, I mean, I started climbing in the gym and that was all I cared about because also I was in Houston. It's all I knew. Um, And then when I moved out east, everyone told me, they were like, oh, well, the gym is training outdoors, what's real? And also, I was still like brand new to climbing. So I was like, okay, duh. Like, don't even have to think twice about it. 
Um, and then I, yeah, it was years later and it was, you know, I was just busy with work <clears throat> and, you know, I think it was just the natural idea of like, Oh, well, I kind of want to try hard. This was in the South. So it's, you know, uh, an eight month summer basically. Yep. yep. Um, and it's funny cause that was also the time that it made me realize how valuable taking the gym a little more seriously um, and thinking it as outdoors was helpful. Yeah. I guess I should qualify my answer with, I started the same way as you like climbing indoors and that's what I cared about. Mm -hmm. I couldn't wait to get into the gym to try my project again. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But then I became a trad climber and that fucked everything up. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so I started <laughs> looking at the gym as a, a useless tool even. So, uh, I had to come back around eventually. Yeah. It, you know, it's, it's funny. I was talking with, um, one of my clients about this not too long ago. He's been climbing a long time, big outdoor experience. And then, but also like a lot of indoor experience and, but his life has changed now. He has more roles with work, has children, a yep. bunch of different things. And we were just talking about, man, just how fun climbing is in general. Like, he had made a breakthrough on like a board project. This was like over the summer, no outdoor climbing was happening. And he was like, you know, he's like, honestly, if outdoor rock climbing didn't exist, I would still climb. It's still, Absolutely. he's like, I love, I love having something that I train for. I love the, the movement, the problem solving. And like, there's just so much enjoyment that I get out of this. And we were kind of talking about that, how, yeah, it's like there was it there was it like I feel that same way now. But there was a time where I was like, oh no, that's absurd. Like, you know, the gym is for getting better outdoors, purely. Yep, yep. I agree completely. Uh number one on our list, we've got the top six here things that we could come up with. And number one thing you can learn in the gym a little easier and then take it outside is to be picky about what you're projecting. Mm -hmm. those things that are at your top level, your hardest things you're going to do in the gym, you have the ability to like sample 25 different things in 30 minutes if you want to. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, and we tend to be picky in the gym when we go outside. Maybe it's a different story. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is such a common trap. I mean, people will be like, Oh, I want to climb my first 13 a, and so maybe their friends are like, well, this one's good. And so they go up it and they're like, okay, I'm going to start projecting it. And it's like, they try, they've tried one route now And who knows, like that could be the hardest possible 13 a for them, even if it's easier for your friends or if it's good for your friends. Um, it's so easy to fall into this trap. And I, I get it because it's also, I mean, if it's a new grade, if it's something very hard, especially with sport climbs, it's such an endeavor to go yeah. try the thing. And, yeah. you know, you might have, might be a long drive. You might have, it might be a big hike. There might not be any other 13 A's at that crag. So that is like, that is what your day is dedicated around. And so there's this sunk cost fallacy of, yeah. well, I've already, I did a lot of research for this. Like I asked around a lot, like I put a lot of thought into this, it took me a whole day to like even try it and go up it. I feel like I need to project it now. And yeah, totally. I get it. I'm like, absolutely. But man, I've worked with so many people who will be like, oh yeah, I'm trying. This is my first V8. I'm like, oh, yikes. <laughs> like, they're like, oh, my friend recommended it. I'm like, is your friend on your team or the boulders? Like, bro, like try literally any other. Um, but yeah. And I mean, I've, I've known people who have like frittered away whole seasons into trying something unknowingly that was they might as well have been skipping that grade entirely, but it was yeah. the first thing they tried and they were like, okay, cool. This is it. And like, you know, maybe they have that great like challenge mindset of V8 is hard. Like this feels hard. Okay. I need to rise to this level. Like, and I think that's cool, but sometimes you should hunt around and find the thing on your level. <laughs> yeah, totally. If you're not, if the heart, <laughs> you know, if you're getting on this thing that you want to rise to its level and it's the hardest thing you've ever tried, it might be faster and usually is whether we want to think so or not 
to step it down a level, climb some similar things that are easier, that you can do faster, gain the skills, and then step back up. Mm -hmm. Um, That might be the faster way to get to that thing. Um, but we're talking about the top level here, and you you brought up an interesting point, the the sunk cost fallacy. I've never thought about it, but I've never once in the gym like applied <laughs> that sunk cost fallacy. Like, well, I spent my whole session last session trying this boulder. I have to finish it. Yeah. That doesn't happen. I can reset every time I walk into the gym if I want to. Yeah. But outside, you're exactly right. It's like I spent a whole day, you know, I, I went up this thing twice. Now I'm committed. <laughs> Shoot, <laughs> you know? pe- people won't even change their beta sometimes. They're like, well, I've already, know. you know, I tried that beta like five times now. I've basically got it locked <laughs> in. I can't try anything else. It's like, <laughs> what? But yeah, I mean, I get it. Like I, I've, I've been that person before for sure. Yeah. And that's a, that's a perfect example of like, I did a, I did one of the remix episodes I did this past year was about failure. And I, the point I came to was that maybe if we give up more often, which is really the only way to really fail in climbing, Mm -hmm. you know, if we give up on things more often, it might lead to sending more, better, harder things. And this is one of those reasons why, because we, we get into that sunk cost mindset and stick to the thing. But in the gym, we're we're really good about being picky. Like this thing suits me, I'm gonna climb on it. Yeah. A tactic that's commonly used by the best climbers is this idea of project shopping. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I've I've had friends who will go out and like I've got a three week trip, and it's like they spend their first week only trying different routes, like just going up, like bolt to bolting, being like, nope, this isn't it. Okay, next one. Uh, maybe. And then next one. Nope, that's not it. They'll do that for like multiple days. And then they know which one they want to try and they'll zero in and they do a really good job of getting stuff done. Um, Totally. You know, you look at uh, Jorg Verhoeven. He had his project nine. Was it project nine B? I think so. Yep. Yeah. You wanted to climb 15 B or nine uh, French nine B. And he had a whole blog post. He was like, here's the whatever 15 nine B's I've tried, you know, to All try the world. Yeah. Yes. And that's like, that is such an endeavor to travel that much, check out all these different routes and truly assess them like that. But if you're going to break into a new high level grade, you know, it's worth the investment. It's probably, that is probably a faster. I don't know if it's faster to fly around the world for most of us. Let's be real. Um, <laughs> Probably not as good for the environment, but you know, for real. Yeah. I know I was, I was thinking that as I was saying this out loud, I was like, I'm not actually like, uh, saying, you know, this, what you should do is take 15 flights all around the world to decide what project you want to climb on. We're flying around the metaphorical world here. (laughs) Um, but yeah, hike around your local crags, like check out different things. Honestly, this is something that I like to, um, when it is like early season, let's say it's still a little too hot. Um, for boulders, man, I'll go out and I'll hike and like, you know, on a rest day, I'll go hike through boulder fields and go like scope out problems. And yep. like that takes so much pressure off of, you know, feeling like I need to do something in the moment. So I go out on a crisp 40 degree day and I'm like, oh, I'm just going to go walk around and touch holds and maybe pull on and try a few things. It feels like a waste. But mm-hmm. when it's a little bit of the off season, it's like, oh, yeah, I can like pull on try holds or try moves maybe or just like hike around and look at things because there's so many things that, you know, you just see it. You're like, oh, yikes. And sometimes you're like, oh, OK, maybe, you know, maybe in like 30 degree colder temps, like I bring a few more crash pads. Like, yeah, I think this is like totally worthwhile. Maybe the hike isn't as bad as everyone made it out to be. Um, you know, you can yep. especially if you do it early in the season you can start hyping up your friends, be like, oh man, this looks like super soft in your style. Like, yeah, you're going to want to bring both of your big pads. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the best way to do it. But yeah, being picky with your top level projects is well worth the investment. Like it takes a little extra time on the front end, but it sets you up for success in the long run. Yeah, and that momentum 
is is a game changer for a lot of people, mm-hmm. especially the chronic projectors who just latch on to the first thing they try. Yeah, yeah. And that leads us right into number two, which is below that top level, tier two, tier three, climb it all, climb mm-hmm. everything, do all the boulders. ATB, all the boulders. Yeah. Yeah. This one, I I mean, I feel like I've talked about it so much, but I just believe in it so strongly. You know, if we're looking at indoors, dude, I'll try anything indoors. Oh, it's like, yeah. like for me, V7 or under, it doesn't matter what it looks like. I'm like, oh, that's cool. I like pink holds. Let's climb on that. It can be like com- <laughs> competition, like foot dino slabs. Cool. Like, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think there's so much value to that. Um, you know, it just makes you more well-rounded and outdoors. I used to be better about this. Um, I think the more back when I used to travel a lot more and used to just spend a lot more time outside, I was a little more patient. Um, and that's something that I'm personally trying to get back into now of, and that was how I spent this last fall was, okay, everything that's not project level. I want to climb every style. Like, yeah. I, you know, in this new granite boulder field for me, little cottonwood, it's like, I want to be able to walk up to any boulder under V9 and be like, cool, I understand it. I know how to climb this. Doesn't matter what it is. Yeah, I agree fully. And, and I think the gym is like the best place to do that. Mm -hmm. So, so we sort of fall into it naturally there because you stand in any one place and there are 50 things near you that are tier two and tier three. Yes. You know, so it's like, I'm going to climb all these things, whether it's during my warm ups or during circuits or, you know, I'm just going to session it with friends, whatever. You end up climbing all these tier two and tier three things. Um, and maybe that's one of the things I'm not as psyched about, about board culture. Um is that you don't have all those options immediately there that you're looking at. Like you have to sift through and find them. Mm. And, you know, so while it presents you more options, ultimately it's a little tougher to find them initially. Whereas I like walking into a gym and just climbing on all the things. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good point. You know, and something that is, I mean, God, I think anyone who board climbs is pretty guilty of this is, you know, you, yes, there's 20,000 boulders you can pick from, but yeah. you're the one swiping through until something catches your eye. Right. And why does it catch your eye? Like, <laughs> exactly. that's just it. It's like, Ooh, this looks fun. This looks good. Versus, you know, it's almost comical to say that these big mega gyms are very limited. It's like, Oh, yeah. this gym yeah. only has 300 boulder problems. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, you, If you keep going in there like two, three days a week, you're going to keep climbing through all like the low hanging fruit and you're going to want to keep doing new things. So you do. It's hilarious to think that like a 300 or 400 boulder gym is limited. But when, (laughs) yeah, when you compare it to a board that has tens of thousands of problems, it really is. And it kind of forces you into that. Yeah. And I think outside it's a little tougher to do that. Not only because you know, it's, you don't have that many options right there in front of you in most cases. Uh, in some cases you certainly do, you know, if you're a red river climber, you can have your 513 project and there can be 25, 512s and 11s at the same crag, you know, yeah. and you should yeah. do those while you're warming up or while you're cooling down or whatever. Um, but I think it's a little tougher to do outside simply because of that same sunk cost fallacy. Like I don't want to, I don't want to spend my time on these things that I'm not like getting the glory for. Totally. And it's like, it's easy to get stuck in this almost over performance oriented, like short term performance oriented focus for outdoor climbing. Uh, yep. And I, I mean, a lot of sport climbers are probably the most guilty of this um, because going up a new route, if, like I, I'll tell people, I'm like, oh yeah, for your warm up, like go climb like V11 that you're very comfortable with, and then go try and onsite a mid 512 before you hop on your 13. Did you say go go climb V11 you're comfortable with, and then go try to onsite your 512 project. 
Yes. Yeah. Uh, I climb with a lot of... There are some uh, boulders like that. I was about to say, I work with boulders. Um, No. You're 5'11". You know, climb up something moderate. And then go try and on-site something that uh, maybe you've got a 50-50 shot on for on-siting. Then try your project. Dude, and people will just be like, I'm sorry, but what happens if I get tired trying to on-site it? Like, oh, well, who cares? Like... It'll if you get kind of pumped, it's going to be a good warm up. And this is a new route. We need to do new routes. You need to experience new styles. Honestly, if you're going to get better at hard red pointing, you need the ability to like run into bad situations and not get yeah. flustered because totally. red points rarely go perfectly. And if you're waiting for that perfect go because your style is too brittle every time you have some sort of adversity, man. You know, projects are going to take four or five times as long. Then if you can be a little more robust, be good at on-siting. But that's hard to do because, yeah, with projecting, you're like, well, I have my three warm-ups I do. I pull on my tension board X amount of times. I bolt a bolt. I brush the holds the fifth bolt. I come down, rest 15 minutes, and then I give my red point go. And I will repeat yeah. this for the next three seasons. Like, <laughs> Yeah, totally. And, you know, just to add to that, like right now I'm – I have very limited time, so I'm going outside and, and climbing and I get really short sessions outside and I've only been climbing on one route. Like I, mm-hmm. I warm up by going bolt to bolt and then I give red point efforts or link efforts or whatever it is, you know, that I'm in that point at. And I climbed in the gym the other day and was like, wow, I've fallen into this trap of like, that's the only thing I can climb right now. Like I don't feel snappy. I feel sluggish. You know, I feel like I'm in shape on that route. Mm -hmm. Um, So when I went into the gym, I just climbed a bunch of things and I walked out of the gym feeling way better. And if I had longer days outside, I would absolutely be doing that. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously it's, it definitely isn't perfect for everyone, but I would say if you're looking for, Long-term progress, and if you have the time for it, man, anything under project level, like climb all the styles. And the way I typically describe it to my clients is the further down the pyramid you go, so the further away from your peak performance, the broader the style and quality uh, range you should be allowing for. Totally. Um, And this kind of, I mean, quality might sound funny, but if you've been climbing somewhere for a while, you've climbed all of the five star moderates Mm -hmm. like, you know, probably climbed all the four stars and man, I'll talk with people all the time who are, I'm like, okay, they're like, Oh, I want to climb my first V10. I'm like, cool. Let's get some wins in early in the season. What V sevens and eights do you have, you know, locally that you haven't done. And they'll be like, Oh, I've done them all. I'm like, you've done, you've done them all. Like, (laughs) well, you know, there's some, but they're not that good. And long story short, I end up just, uh, cajoling these people into going and trying two-star rock climbs. Man, and so often that'll be the highlight of their season. Maybe not like the performance highlight, but they'll be like, man, that was like, that was cool. And I got all my friends to try it. And like none of us had ever done it before. It was really good. And, you know, it felt good to top out a new boulder in a boulder field I've spent hundreds of days in. Like, yeah, the further down from your project range you go, the weirder the climbs you should be doing are. I have yet to have a guidebook and I have a very large collection of guidebooks up here above my head. Um, I have yet to see a guidebook whose quality rating I fully agree with. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll find five star boulders or roots that I'm just like, meh. And then I find two star boulders and roots that I'm like, whoa, that's the best route I've ever climbed here. (laughs) Yeah. So you should be trying them all. And I think one of the things that happens is in the gym, by climbing all of these lower level things, you know, second tier, third tier things, we build up this high literacy in the gym. Like we speak that gym language really well. And then we go outdoors and we don't feel like we're speaking the language as well. And that's because you're doing like I'm doing right now outside and only climbing on one thing or two or three things. Mm -hmm. And you're not, you're not putting yourself in the situation to expand your, you know, ability to speak that language. So going and climbing more things is just going to help you do that. Absolutely. And I will say one other thing, um, in defense of one and two move boulders, I don't know if we've Mm. talked about this, 
Um, I've had this conversation a few times with clients, but a lot of people hate one movers or two movers. Wow, I love one movers. <laughs> Circus tricks, they'll call them. Um, and I get it. I've been on that side before. Um, or some people are like, wow, I only have to do one move and that'll make it my first V9. I'm like, you know, you were looking at this wrong. Like <laughs> one move V9 is terrible. Um, but I think if you're a more advanced climber and you look back at these one and two move problems and you're like, uh, I don't know. Here is my argument for them. Boulder math. So there's the whole idea of like you add two boulders together, take the average and add two. Um, so for instance, like V7 into V7, take the average, add two, V9. So here's the thing, like some coaches will argue, well, you're not going to do V10 moves on, you know, V6 or V7. So you can only learn that on V10. I respectfully disagree. Yeah. If I, you I do as well, <laughs> maybe less respectfully. Um, <laughs> if you do four one move V6s, that's V10. For sure. Math. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like there is. That's V10 and it that could be 14C. It could be for. <laughs> <laughs> you right. add in a few sections of hard 512. Yeah, with some bad rests. Yeah. Oof. Yeah, that's 514 at least. But I think it's easy to look at these one move wonders and be like, mm, that's silly. That's dumb. It's a circus trick. But I like to look at it as. I mean, this was whenever I wanted to break into 514, the way I did it was I just picked the most bouldery 13 B's I could. And I was like, can I climb a 13 B that is basically just a V8 on a rope composed? Because if I can do that, that's the, I mean, that's probably the difficulty of most 514 cruxes, but you have to do it fatigued or you're going to have to do multiple of them. But that's, I mean, I spent a whole season just being like, I'm going to chase the most rowdy bouldery like single bolt difficulty 13 b's or like maybe even 13 c's because i want to be able to climb this difficulty composed man and it worked out great that was like a breakthrough season for me and i think we can look for at boulders in the exact same way pick yep. these a little like one movers because yeah one move v7 that's like honestly that could be the crux of a v10 or v11 right there like you're, Absolutely. yes, you're going to have to do it fatigued. You might have to do one or two of them, but like that comes into play. Yep. I agree completely. And then our third one here is, and I, this is a strange one for me because I, I rarely encounter this myself. Um, I like having people around, uh, even if they're people I don't know, I like to perform in front of people. It makes me nervous. Mm -hmm. But then once I pull on, I, I always climb better. And that's essentially that performing around people. And I think this can go several different ways. Like there's the learning to still pull on and still try hard, even though there's a bunch of people standing there watching or working it as well. And then there's also the getting better at the skill of like sharing beta with each other. Yes. Um, and queuing up and things like that. All the things that come with the, there's a crowd on my boulder or there's four other parties on my sport climb that I want to try. You can learn that stuff in the gym and we do. We tend to lean into it a little more in the gym. Whereas outdoors, if we see somebody on the thing we want to climb, we're like, okay, changing my whole plan for the day now. Yes, absolutely. Man, and I love that you brought in the collaboration part as well, because that, yes, performing in front of others, I think is super important. And you should often ask yourself, like, would I climb this way if no one else was here? Mm. You know, if you're being hesitant, if you go halfway up a sport climb and you're like, oh, maybe it's not going great. And if you're just like, hey, you know what? Just lower me to your belayer. Yeah. Yeah. Would you do that if it was just you and your belayer? Like, I mean, that's important to ask that question. Um, and obvious, like also the collaboration, let's say, you know, you're halfway up a sport climb, you're dogging on it and someone walks up and is like, Hey, what's the lineup on? Like, like on this man, the best thing you can do is to just have a conversation and be like, Hey, it's uh, just me right now. And just let you know, I'm kind of dogging up it. It's my first time on it. 
I've had people say that to me when I've walked up to get on a route for the first time ever. And it's great because I'll be like, oh, you take your time because it's going to take me an hour to get get up this thing. Like, you know, don't rush because I don't want to feel rushed. And that's great. Suddenly it's like, man, it takes so much stress out of the situation. Or even if, you know, if someone else is like, oh, I'm going to be red pointing, you know, you can have these conversations like (laughs) communication goes so far. Like (laughs) it is so important, even with like in all relationships, but especially in relationships with strangers that you're going to share, share rock climbs with. Totally. I think it's so important to learn all of that. And learn like, you know, if it's a, you're talking sport climbs, if it's a boulder to get better at the skill of being like, do you want to know what I did? Or, Mm -hmm. you know, are you interested in trying other things Uh, instead of just going, no, put your foot there, you know, like learning the collaborative process uh, happens so much more easily in the gym for whatever reason, probably because there are more people. And in the gym, people sort of like trend toward where the people are. You yeah, know, it's like naturally. everybody's climbing this problem. Oh, I'm going to go climb on it too. Mm-hmm. And outside, it's so different. People are just like, oh, there's a crowd on that boulder. <laughs> I yeah. might never try it again, you know? So... I think learning that collaboration in real time and seeing other people do it um, is so valuable for you to then take outside. And and if you can jump right in outside and be the, you know, be a, a collaborative member of this group, uh, it's just going to feel better for you than standing to the side waiting for your turn. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's like you know, a lot of my favorite memories with climbing are the people I was climbing around. And so often it was like, I I meet so many people climbing, not by like, you know, because we're sharing a project or we're at the same boulder or whatever it is. And we start discuss like talking in that manner rather than, you know, it's not like I go up and I'm like, hello, I am Nathan. Like, you know, in some <laughs> other weird way, it's yeah. just like, oh, hey, I saw you bumped to that side pole. What's going on there? Hi, totally. Nathan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, so many times I've, you know, been part of a group and I see someone do different beta and I'm like, whoa, 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 hold on. Show me that shit again. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? It, it is this collaboration, I think, is such a great way to expedite learning and improvement yeah. too. Um, you know, I, I think that one of the best things you can do for your climbing is route setting. Because you're constantly having to just iterate and think about moves differently. And it's so one-to-one with this. But the next best thing is to problem solve with someone else who sees this climb differently than you, who has a different way of communicating, who just, you know, maybe they have a different body, different style, all these things. Hope they have a different body. Um, (laughs) But having those communications, you learn so much. It's amazing. It like there's a reason you look at all pros like they session together all of the time. They're constantly talking about what they're doing, what they're trying, what they haven't tried, what they're considering. Man, mm-hmm. it is endless. Like and there's a reason they're so good. And you know, to talk about the other side of this a little bit, the you know, performing in front of people when you don't like to climb in front of people. You know, I hear people say that a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't, I don't like climbing in front of people. I don't climb well in front of people. Didn't try my project this. today. There were people there. Exactly. I've seen people waste a whole season because when they're planning the season, they want to get on the five-star route. <laughs> but if you're choosing good routes, there's a good chance there are going to be other people also choosing that route. Yeah. And you're going to walk up and, and that's a tough place to be because you stand, if that person is stronger, you stand to learn some things by talking to them and communicating with them about this route you're climbing on. Mm -hmm. And if that person is not stronger, maybe they've had to figure out better beta than you. Yeah. Because you powered your way through it or whatever. So you can learn something from them. And practicing that in the gym, learning to like 
take your breath, you know, you're nervous, you're, you're scared to get on it. You don't want to fall in front of people, but, but learning to get on and put that out of your head in the gym where it's easier and you get that opportunity, you know, two or three days a week, as opposed to one day on the weekends or something. Yeah. Um, learn it there. Then you can take it outside and then you've got a much better chance. You're not wasting days of climbing the the best routes out there that always have crowds on them. I completely agree. All right, for our next 3, we are going to we're going to give those to our patrons um, over at patreoncom climbing where we have the We Scream Like Eagles podcast. There are well over 100 patron-only episodes over there now. Um, so we would love it if you would go over there, check those out. It's three bucks a month. So uh, I think that you can do it for a year for $30 or something and get at least two board meetings every single month. Um, I think it's really valuable. And I mean, for your first month or two, if you just want to come in for a month or two and you can devour all hundred plus of those episodes, <laughs> then feel free to do that. Uh, but our, our last three, our favorite three are going over there to the patrons. So we'll see you over there. This time to build.